morning, everyone. <coughs> you probably have heard so many times this morning, Happy New Year. And uh, Andy raised the bar with his creative way and said, Happy Decade. So what am I supposed to say? Happy day, happy Sunday, happy week, everything. Happy, happy New Year. 2020. Where did all the years go? Did we skip some years in between? Wow. I wish uh, and pray that this year will be a year that we will follow the Lord's vision closely and, uh, and follow Him, and uh, may it be a year of our growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was reminded of this verse in Philippians 2 where Paul says, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus, as he singles out Timothy from the group of people who are seeking their own interest. So may the Lord grant us the desire to seek God's interest, the Lord's vision this year, and uh, help us grow in Him. So maybe someone is looking up on the screen and is saying, you say, Happy New Year. How come we are starting the year with the book of Leviticus, of all the books in the Bible? Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Do you know what is considered the least favorite book in the Bible? <laughs> Any guesses? Now, if you said Leviticus you would be wrong on the first Sunday of the week. It's actually the book of Obadiah, which is, according to Paul's, which is the least favorite book of the Bible. I don't know why, because it's a one-chapter book. So we are not at least preaching from the least favorite book of the Bible, right? So you've got to be happy about that. You know, Bill McDonald said everyone is entitled to have a favorite book of the Bible. And if I were to ask the question, how many of you have the favorite book of the Bible as the Gospel of John? And I think hands would rise up. The book of Psalms. Yeah, the book of uh, Proverbs. Yeah, the book of Leviticus. You see, that's what I thought. You know, the book is often referred to as the most boring book of the Bible, which is really unfortunate as you think of uh, the contents that are in there. I've heard people say things like it is the, that old book with the dusty pages. It has the different types of the offerings and sacrifices and blood and blood and blood and blood all over. It has the strict codes, dress codes for the priests and the strict rules and regulations all over the book. How can this be an interesting book? And you see the kosher laws, the dietary laws for the people of Israel, and the list goes on, on and on. And then there is that section where no preacher would dare to deal with, dealing with the skin diseases, and the uncleanness from childbirth and the bodily discharges you. And as a preaching team, we're thinking, is this a passage like, Lord, is this like fool's Russian where angels fear to tread? What are we getting ourselves into? So you got to wait and see who the lucky winner is to preach that part of the book of Leviticus. So when was the last time we preached from the book of Leviticus at Hillview Bible Chapel? The answer is never. Never, ever. So you're a blessed group of people <laughs> to be able to have us go through this book, which is really a good book, in, in my opinion. So when was the last time you read the book of Leviticus? You know, we were having uh, lunch with the family over the break, and we got into the conversation about what is the next preaching series that he'll be coming to. And uh, we were talking about the book of Leviticus, and, uh, and the lady mentioned, you know, I have never read the book of Leviticus in my life. You know, Leviticus is not really a dinner table conversation kind of a book, right? And I was imagining a dinner table conversation with regular families here talking about the rules and regulations, the dietary laws, and the bodily discharges and so on. And then I was imagining an Indian family having a conversation like this, really? We cannot have a conversation along these lines in these chapters and the details that are in there. If it was not the Word of God, we probably wouldn't be dealing with passages like this. You know, this is why this is called the Bible. Because the Bible covers every aspect of life. Bible covers what God's heart is, what God's desire is because of a covenant relationship that he had with the children of Israel in the Old Testament and the covenant that he has with us in the New Covenant as God's children in this New Testament dispensation. 
Now we understand that it is a difficult read, and the reason is it is not meant to be read. The book of Leviticus is meant to be studied. It is true that the book contains laws and offerings and sacrifices and blood and so on. But listen, you got to be happy this morning. It is really a happy new year. It's really a happy new decade. You know, the reason is, <clears throat> we will emphasize this over and over in, um, in the series, that Christ is the fulfillment of all the law of the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. You really have to be telling, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much that I'm in the New Testament dispensation. I don't have to bring a bull here. I don't have to bring a goat. I don't have to come to Hillview Bible Chapel where his blood splattered all over the place. Aren't you thankful? Because Christ came to fulfill the law. You know, when King David wrote the book of Psalms, there were only five books in the Bible, which is the five first books, the Torah or the Pentateuch. And King David considered these laws, and he took a look at the law, and he said he was so blessed to have the law in his life. So Psalm 119 is a celebration of God's law. David said, Psalm 119, uh, I, uh, along, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Can you imagine going through the book of Leviticus and saying, Lord, your law is my delight. And I really rejoice in this passage of the scripture. Now, as a preaching team, I want to tell you, we, we struggle through several passages in, in this book. In the first meeting, we talked about, hey, for us to be able to preach from a book, our preaching has to fulfill these four criteria. It has to be biblical. Secondly, it has to be clear. It has to be engaging. And it has to be relevant. Well, we went through one by one. Is it Leviticus biblical? Of course, Leviticus is biblical. Well, is it clear? Probably not. And we can probably do a good job of meeting very often and see how we can improve in bringing clarity to some of the difficult passages. But how can we be engaging? So we came up with some ideas. So one of the ideas is what you have in your hands, which is the worksheet. You know, we're gonna, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we'll try to see if we could get the worksheets every week. But then we are using our website as a place where we, we're going we're to um, upload all our worksheets and different reference materials and so on. So we can make use of the reference materials and charts, which we, which we will start uploading in the next week or so. But before every message by Thursday or so, we have a team that works on that. They will upload the worksheet by Thursday so you can uh, download it and uh, use your um, smart device to take notes on it if you want to. But then, is it relevant? So we look at one passage and say, well, some parts of it is relevant. This is relevant, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant, irrelevant, relevant, relevant, relevant. Irrelevant, irrelevant, irrelevant. So we're going back and forth as a team for a long time. And then one of the team members, Jim Callahan, gave this quote. Well, he said this. He said, the relevance of the book can get lost in the irrelevance. And we do not want to just communicate irrelevance where there is relevance that has to be emphasized. And we all were like, well, that was the quote for the day. We're going to write that down. There are so many irrelevance in the book of Leviticus, and you have to be thank thankful to the Lord for that. But then there are relevance in the book, which we don't want to bury under irrelevance and say the book is not relevant to us. That would be a wrong interpretation of the scriptures. So we do understand there are quite a few things that do not directly apply to us as believers in the New Testament time, but... At the same time, we do not want to take our eyes off of the big picture as to why the Lord has given this book to us. So that's where I want to start this morning as we introduce this book to the body here. Is the book of Leviticus relevant? We know a few things. We know that Christ has fulfilled uh, the demands of the law. We know that there are some cultural things that are in the book, uh, and those cultural things have changed over the years. And we know there are these ceremonial laws of cleansing in chapters uh, 
uh, 14 and 15, especially as we come to the middle section there. And uh, some of those do not really apply to us today. But what is directly relevant to us is based on what has not changed over time, from the time of Leviticus to today. And if those things have not changed over time, then nobody can say the book of Leviticus is not relevant to us today. Make sense? So what is relevant to us will be made clear as we consider these three things. First of all, as we look at the holiness of God. We'll see more reasons as we go along, but the main reason why we should invest in the book of Leviticus is that in this book we see for the very first time why God wants to have relationship with man and how a holy God can del- dwell with sinful people. Or in other words, how a sinful man can approach a holy God. For the first time ever, you see the principles that God is laying down here based on which only a man, a sinful man can approach a holy God. The book paints the holiness of God like no other book in the Bible. The Hebrew word, which is Kodesh, in in the book of Leviticus, is mentioned about 98 times, which is the most mentioned in any book of the Bible. Why? Because you are approaching God. You are sinful. I am sinful. And God is absolutely holy. So holiness is the criteria in which we have to approach God. But how can we be holy? we got to talk about that. Now, if you were longing to see what the theme verse of the book is, is it, uh, it is in uh, chapter 19, verse 2, speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You're probably thinking, wow, that's an Old Testament passage. Well, actually, Peter quotes directly. He says in 1 Peter chapter 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So what Peter is saying is, you guys were in your former lusts. You were doing sinful things. That was your pattern. Now you're saved. Saved to whom? Saved to a holy God. Now you have a relationship with the holy God. And what you got to be doing is, do not be conformed to that former life, but be like him. Be like the holy God. Okay, where are you basing that off of, Peter? Peter is saying, it is written. It is written where? In the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, he's going back to that book and he's saying, it is written. Peter is writing to to the Gentile people, isn't he? And he's reading a Jewish passage that was given to the Jewish people and saying, because God is holy from the book of Leviticus, you got to get out of the former manner of life or the lusts. How do holy people live? Paul says in Colossians 3.12, And as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, and gentleness, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That's holiness. If you want to be holy like God, we're only not talking about moral holiness. We're only not talking about purity in life. We are talking about forbearance. We are talking about humility. We are talking about gentleness, kindness, bearing one another, forgiving each other like how God forgave us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's being holy like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the book of Leviticus, we're going to see uh, the story of two guys by name Nadab and Abihu. Future parents... Don't name your boys as Nadab and Abihu. These guys were the sons of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. And these guys were like, we got it all. We're going to go to the presence of God. And they brought some strange fire. You want to know what strange fire is? We're going to cover that in chapter 10. 
So they brought this strange fire and two verses. How many verses? Two verses. Verse number one, they bring the fire to the Lord. Verse number two, they're gone. Such is the God you serve. How often we misuse the grace of God, isn't it, today? You know, God doesn't judge us like how he judged Nadab and Abihu in the Old Testament. And we do misuse the grace of God in our lives. And they did not see the holiness of God like they ought to have seen it. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, we have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and the expected thing. I slip here, I slip there. I slip for a week, I slip, I'm holy for a day. And we have come to learn, this is so natural for me. But we dare to come to the presence of God with sin because God is gracious. But remember, the book of Leviticus is going to tell us that God whom we serve, the God whom we worship is a God who needs to be revered. He's an awesome God. He's a God who is holy in the absolute sense of the word. So the holiness of God hasn't changed. It is still relevant as much as it was in the book of Leviticus. And secondly, obedience to God's commandments. Here is another aspect that is highlighted over and over again in the book of Leviticus. Starting from chapter 18, primarily, you will see a lot of commandments where the Lord says, you shall do this, you shall not do this. You will do this, and you will not do this. Based on what? Based on this. Based on the fact that he is the Lord. 49 times in 27 chapters, primarily between chapters 18 and 27, you see that phrase over and over and over again, like you want to say, God, I got it. I am the Lord. I mean, even in the passage where it talks about the dietary laws, which food you got to eat, which food you should not be eat, and all these birds and animals, and you will get to it. But the end of it, he says, I am the Lord, and you got to treat me holy. You cannot bring detestable things before me, says the Lord, because he is holy. So there is something that God has for us in that passage that we need to be looking at and saying, I want to obey God like how he is expecting uh, us to do. Here are some examples there. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live according to Live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. And every one of you shall reverence his father and mother. And this is directly after he's saying, I'm, I'm holy. Because I'm holy, you got to be holy. In the very next verses, every one of you shall reverence his father and mother. And you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord. I am the Lord your God. Don't turn to idols or make yourself molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And so on. And then in the New Testament, we see similar verses. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. The same principles apply, don't they? When you study the Word of God, prove yourselves to be the doers of Word, which means when the Word of God is presented before you, make sure you obey God's Word. First John says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's pretty strong, isn't it? If you don't obey what God says in uh, 1 John 2, 5, who, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The difference, though, is in the Old Testament, the motivation to obey God was the fear of God. Remember Nadab and Abihu? Remember how much people would have had that on their wall frames, picture of Nadab and Abihu. The Lord just killing them right at that time. They're gone. But now in the New Testament, you obey God, not because primarily the fear of God. We need to have the fear of God, which we're going to talk about more, but primarily because Christ loved us. And the love of God compels me to do things which I wouldn't do otherwise. And then the third thing that would make this book relevant to a believer today is the principles in approaching God. 
the principles in approaching God. As I mentioned earlier, the book of Leviticus is a manual to approach God as God's covenant people. Since God is holy, he must be approached in a way that is prescribed by him. Now, if you're a believer, a New Testament believer, and you believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and his atoning work, you are not a foreigner to the word sacrifice. Christ Jesus is the Lamb of God whose blood was shed for our sins. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Christ died on the cross. His blood was shed. We remember that week after week after week, don't we? So we know the word sacrifice. It's not a anathema to us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 Uh, It says, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But it's not a new fancy idea that God came up with when Christ was born in this world. Ever since man became a sinner, the only way to ever restore relationship with a holy God is through a sacrifice. So you might ask the question, why is sacrifice necessary? Why is blood necessary to bring about that relationship repair? Well, God is holy. He's unapproachable. He's absolutely perfect in all his ways. And man becomes a sinner by choice. He's on the other extreme of of the spectrum. He cannot approach God. And because he sinned, he needs to go. The wages of sin is death. He needs to go. So God, in his grace, in his provision, made it possible for an animal to be sacrificed on behalf of a man so God, because of his love, can somehow bring about that relationship back. You get that? So the the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament was really an act of grace by God so you are the Old Testament believers, people who wanted to have that relationship with God, can have the possibility of coming together to be in a relationship with God. Leviticus uh, 17, verse 11, another important verse in Leviticus, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. You being a sinner, your life has to be taken out. You got to be killed. But the Lord says, because life is in the flesh, I'm going to make a provision for you that by blood, by the reason of blood, there is atonement. So the sacrifices of the Old Testament is a temporary solution until Jesus Christ came. So the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross is what we call a substitutionary sacrifice, don't we? In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all. For who? The just, which is God, the gospel outline verse, isn't it? The just for the unjust. Why? So that he might bring us to God having put to death in the flesh, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So this is the substitutionary sacrifice. This is the substitutionary death. So in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Leviticus, when we talk about all these offerings and sacrifices and blood and so on, it's a substitution for the sinner who should be coming to the presence of God, but he has no provisions to. But God says, you bring a bull, you bring a lamb, You shed that blood on your behalf, and in faith as you do that, I'm going to accept it as an offering. So we come first to God's presence because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is salvation. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 talks about. But that's not all. So not only do we come to God's kingdom or God's presence, by trusting in the blood of Jesus, but we also continue to have relationship with him because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. An Old Testament believer could not do that. If the Old Testament believer thinks, you know what, I'm in a mood to give thanks to God. 
he cannot say, thank you, God. And he will think like, I want to give thanks to God because God has given me a good reap, reaping this year. And I want to give, show my gratitude to God. And he would think, wow, I need to go to the tabernacle. I need to bring a bull. I need to bring a bunch of grain crops, which is from my field. And I need to offer that to God. And then the priest would come and say, your offer is acceptable. Now you can go. You can give thanks. This is how you give thanks. But today you can lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. In the closet you can say, in the closet of your room, you could, you could do that. In your kitchen you could do that. You can sing praises in the bathroom while you're taking a shower. Why? Because of Jesus. So when we approach God as a believer, it is always on the basis of sacrifice also. For example, another example would be a burnt offering, which is somebody would say, you know, I want to have... Uh, I want to dedicate my life to God. That's a burnt offering. You know, God has blessed me so much. I'm really overwhelmed by the mercy of God. I want to tell God, God, I love you. I want to dedicate myself to you. He has to do a burnt offering. But today, you can go kneel in the presence of God and say Romans 12.1. I want to offer my body a living and a holy sacrifice which is acceptable to God. That's a burnt offering. So today, not only do we come on the basis, not only are we saved on the basis of, on the, basis of uh, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we also should continue to approach God on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, if you, if you, if you have sinned, if you sin through the week as a believer, what do you do? You go in prayer and you confess. And what does the Bible say? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Based on what? Based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the sin offering is. And the guilt offering is something like, you know, I stole something from somebody, or I cheated in my tax coming up. So what do you do? So you not only go to God's presence and say, sorry, Lord, I cheated on my taxes. What do you do? You got to write to the IRS. You got to pick up the phone and call. That's the guilt offering. You know Zacchaeus, in the book of Luke, when the Lord visited him, he said, Lord, I have sinned. If I have sinned with anybody, what did he say? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to return this fourfold. Well, the guilt offering says you not only have to return what you stole, but you also add, you have to add 20% of it. So Zacchaeus is saying, I'm going to add more to what is required by the law. Where did, it, where did he get this idea from? From the book of Leviticus. So you will start to see much of the New Testament passages making a lot of sense as we dig into it a little bit more and encourage ourselves of this truth. And um, so when we talk about coming to God in salvation, for salvation through the gospel, coming to God as a believer on a daily basis through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what, we, what do we call that? We call this a gospel, isn't it? Paul says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you also stand. You, you stand on that gospel. You stand on the basis of the sacrifices, as the believers in the Old Testament did, on the basis of sacrifices. But praise be to God because of Jesus. I don't have to do any of that, but I still come on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder Paul said in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. This study is, is supposed to give us encouragement. Every part of the Bible, every verse of the Bible is supposed to give us encouragement. And through that encouragement and perseverance, we might have hope that we will see our Lord Jesus Christ one day. Second uh, Timothy 3, all scripture is inspired by God. It doesn't say all scripture minus Leviticus, does it? All scripture. 
You know, it, it is with that attitude that we'll have to go to the book and say, is there something that I'm not aware of? Is that something that I need to be learning through the instructions from this book? So don't be caught in the irrelevance of it. Study the relevance and you will really enjoy it. From the remainder of the time that I have, let's uh, take a quick look at the content of the books, which uh, I have tried to um, get under these three headings there. First of all, the book of Leviticus is a pretty significant book. It's very interesting to note that um, the book is the first book that is studied by a Jewish child when he would go to a synagogue. And the reason is that this book was considered a manual for, for living. New Testament quotes the book of Leviticus about 40 times. That's a lot of references to one book in the New Testament. You know, when, um, when the Lord Jesus Christ said phrases like Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets, the Lord was talking about the first five books of the Bible, and Leviticus was, was a big part of that. And I would say you really cannot understand the book of Hebrews if you don't have a working knowledge of the book of Leviticus. Now, you take away the book of Leviticus, and you try to interpret verses like, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through, the, through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ through, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God and so on. How are we going to do that? There's no way we can explain. So when we compare these two, we really understand the significance of what Christ did as we understand the significance of this book. And secondly, I want to tell you the book of uh, Leviticus is a pretty systematic book in the sense it is not a randomly placed book in the Bible. And it's pretty logical in its placement in, uh, in the canon. You know, God did give some thought when he uh, placed Leviticus as the third book of the Bible. If you look at the progression from Genesis through uh, Exodus through Leviticus and uh, some of the major themes that we see in these three books, we see some of uh, the major themes being very purposely laid out there. We see creation. Man uh, was created in the book of Genesis, and we see the subsequent sin. But in the book of Leviticus, I'm sorry, Exodus, we see him, uh, we see the picture of redemption there when uh, they were in the slavery of Egypt, and God redeemed them and made a covenant relationship with them in Mount Sinai, remember, in Exodus chapter 19. And the Lord said, you shall be a kingdom of priests to me, and you will be a holy nation and you're going to be my people. You're going to be my possession. So he redeemed them and made them their own and made a covenant relationship with them. And then in Leviticus, we will see that the redeemed people are being sanctified. So man was ruined in the book of Genesis, and man is being delivered in the book of Exodus, and now man is being cleansed and uh, being made ready to worship God and being of service to him. And in uh, Genesis, we see Christ as a promised Savior. As soon as man sinned, we see God coming through and promising the Savior there. And uh, we see Christ as the Passover lamb. He's the one who died as the lamb of God on the cross. And that's a picture of the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus. But when we come to Leviticus, we see Christ as our high priest. He is the one who offers. He's the high priest. He's the perfect one, not from the tribe of Levi, but from the family of Melchizedek. We will see that in the book of uh, Hebrews probably later. So it is not a uh, self-standing book that is not related to any other books of the Bible. So it focuses on the redeemed people walking with God on a daily basis, on the basis of uh, sacrifice and separation. The book uh, is named in, in, in Greek called Luitikan, which means pertaining to the Levites uh, in the Septuagint version of the Bible. Septuagint, is, Septuagint version is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. So when the translation was made, they gave this title Leviticus, which is an unfortunate title really, because if you see the Hebrew meaning of the book, it, it is uh, the word we yigra, which means he called. So if you look at uh, the first verse in Leviticus, it says, and, and the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. So God called to him. That's the, that's the meaning of the book. 
So the book is not just to the priest. The book primarily addresses in the first seven chapters to the normal people, to the regular people in Israel, how they can come to God, how they can approach God. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 talk about the priests and so on. So when we talk about God calling, God speaking, first we will see God speaking to Moses in Exodus 19 when he gave that covenant with him. He spoke to him from the mountain. God is there upon the mountain, and Moses is here, and God spoke from heaven when Moses went up on the mountain. In Leviticus 1, though, I'm sorry, in, in Exodus chapter 40, we will see when Moses dedicates the tabernacle, we will see that the cloud filled that place, which means God came down to dwell in the tabernacle. So the glory filled the place. Where was Moses? Moses was outside. He couldn't go to the presence of God. So there was nobody inside. God was the only one inside there. Nobody can approach him because nobody knew how to approach him. So Moses was outside. So God spoke to him from the tent. And then in Numbers, however, we will see Moses was ready to go, to go into, the, into the tent. So you'll see the difference between Leviticus 1.1 1, 1 and Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. In Leviticus 1, God spoke to him from the tent. Moses was outside. And in Numbers, you will see God speaking to him in the tent, because Moses as a priest now can go to the presence of God. Why? Because of what Leviticus talks about. Because Leviticus first 16 chapters talk about the way to approach a holy God. And then chapters 17 through 27 talk about the way to walk in holiness before this holy God. Leviticus has 27 chapters, but if you see when this was all spoken, it was all in a short span of 50 days. That's it. 27 chapters. This is Lord just dictating things. You know, Leviticus contains the most words that God used directly to speak to somebody, and that is to Moses primarily here. And uh, it's just a dictation of things that he needs to be doing. So it's a, it's a book that contains only about 50 days worth of duration there. And finally... The book of Leviticus is a sanctifying book. Well, you can ask the question, doesn't every book of the Bible sanctify us and does, it, does not every book of the Bible have a sanctifying effect? Yes, that is true. But remember, the purpose of the book of Leviticus is the way to sanctify God's people, is to show how to sanctify God's people and uh, God telling them on his terms how an unholy people can approach a holy God. And as I mentioned earlier, there are different contents in this book, different sections in this book. A guy by name Jace Clark spent about 10 years studying the book of um, uh, Exodus, and he came up with this good commentary, and he has this table in that. He says there are different categories in the book of Leviticus. For example, there are things that are repeated in the New Testament. Are they repeated in the New Testament? Yes. Um, in category two, are they repeated in the New Testament? No, because of cultural re reasons, it is not repeated. And in some cases, no, because they have been set aside by Jesus. Jesus fulfilled it all. And then in category four there, no, because they were particularly related to Israel as a theocratic nation. So there are different sections. But if you look at what the value of each of these category is to a believer in the New Testament time period, I would say yes. Those are very valuable. And that's why this is a very sanctifying book. And we will emphasize a lot of verses uh, as, we, as we move into our series here. And uh, hopefully we can memorize these few verses uh, as, as we go through the next few months. You know, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God. The concept of sacrifice is still applicable on a daily basis to a believer. It is a spiritual act of worship. And we're going to talk about holiness a lot. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And obviously, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. You know, one of the longings in... Uh, in the book of Revelation from John, as he anticipates the coming of Jesus, is this. He says in Revelation 22, 11, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still be righteous. 
and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And as we anticipate the coming of the Lord in 2020, and our desire, our goal, is to see ourselves holier than how we were in 2019. I'll finish with this one quote. A consistent growth in holy life is impossible without a consistent look at the cross. Look at, the, look at Jesus. Look at his sacrifice on a daily basis. You want to have a victorious Christian life? If you don't study the cross, if you don't value the, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't see him as the, as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, if you don't preach the gospel to yourself on a daily basis, there's no way you can be holy. There's no way you can approach God in holiness as he expects us to. And that's our desire as we launch this series today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this book. Thank you, Lord, in your grace, you have made us a provision to approach you. And, uh, and we do that through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and help us to value it over and over again, more and more in a growing fashion as we get into the new year. We seek your blessing upon our series as we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.